Okay. Uh, I will speak English today since we have a guest from US and we have some guests, other guests from US as well. So, but this is about to introduce a new adjunct professor in operational and maintenance, Kai Goebel, who will give us an inaugural speech today. And but just a brief, uh, uh, what is a young professor, you might answer. Uh, and the question, the answer is, it's about linking the university to the society around us, especially companies. And LTU's trademark is actually to have good collaboration with different companies. So that's, of course, of importance. And my role is just to introduce the speech, but I am also head of the Department of uh, Civil, Environmental and Natural Resources Engineering, who hosts the subject area, operational maintenance, which is actually at the moment the strongest research area at the university. In the inaugural lecture, Professor Kai Goebel will talk about prognos prognostics and health management program at NASA. And you can hear now, we have a professor linked to NASA, which I think require a little bit greater introduction than general. So for, for that, I was thinking that I have to cite something. And in my opinion, there is one guy who is quite good to talk about space. It's David Bowie. And he wrote a song, 1969, with the name Space Oddity. And I will cite, that, you know, that was the year the man landed on the moon. And I will cite a few rows from that song, and it starts like, ground control to Major Tom. Ground control to Major Tom. Take your protein pills, helmet on. Con commencing countdown. And in song, check ignition, and may God's love be with you. And maybe we don't need, of course, we may need God lo God's love, but we also need engineers in order to go to March, for example, which is maybe the next big event when we talk about man in the space. So, but maybe linked to this topic, I think I will say. Welcome, Professor Kai Goebel. Your, the floor is yours. Thank you for your kind introduction. <laughs> I'd also like to thank uh, Professor Uday Kumar for inviting me, and uh, that's the reason why I'm here and why we, we now uh, are, are connected, as, as, we, as we just heard. <coughs> what I would like to do today is to talk about prognostics and health management. Um, uh, since we have lots of uh, aspiring PhDs and already PhDs in the audience, I thought I'd throw a little Latin up there and uh, to test your, your general knowledge. Uh, quo ex vobis et quo vadis. Uh, where do we come from and, and where are we going with regards to prognostics and health management? Um, my company is not a company, it's, it's NASA, it's a, it's a government organization. Um, you may have heard about it. And of course, you know, what everybody wants to uh, see uh, when somebody from NASA comes is, is stuff about rockets. So I just fiddle around with this and hopefully I managed to link the right movie. Let's see whether this works.
explosion rocks the cave. Well, I just had an anomaly of the Delta II long... Thirty-seven seconds into the launch, the onboard computers decided Five O One was ninety degrees off course. We will have uh, first two motor separations at the fifty-six seconds of the flight, and about ten seconds. We have vehicle failure. perhaps a little dramatic um, but it also explains the reason why why we're here right so this is one of the motivations why we are doing prognostics and health management we want to prevent that that kind of stuff and all of the clips that you that you saw there was no crew on board so you know I don't want to uh, be over overly dramatic but um, what we really care about is to to enable mission success, uh, we also do care about cost and we, co we care about safety. And uh, <coughs> th these are the primary motivations for, for prognostics and health management, for condition-based ma maintenance, uh, for systems health management. Th there's many different names for, 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 for these kind of activities. And it's really a systematic assessment of what's going on uh, at, at the system level. Right? And um, as, as you just saw, uh, uh, flying a rocket is 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 a, a very dangerous business. Everything has to work. Uh, you really need to make sure that everything works together, and I and if it doesn't, the the impact can be can be very dramatic. Um, so we we want to assess at any given time uh, is everything working well, and if it doesn't, what exactly is the problem? We we call that diagnostics, and if something is wrong, and we know. Uh, what is wrong, we then would like to uh, understand how long will it take until the system actually breaks, until it comes to failure. And, and that is, is something that astronauts care about, for example, because uh, they need to eject uh, ahead of the pressure curve um, to make it out uh, alive. And oftentimes you only have you know, 2.3 seconds or so uh, to make up your mind from when the initial crack in the, in the rocket casing starts to, to when the whole thing blows. So it's not a whole lot of time, um, you, you have not a whole lot of sensors and, and you have to pretty dang sure that uh, you make the right choice uh, because if you miss the event, you know, that is very un unpopular with the, with the astronauts, um, but if you uh, cry wolf and, and uh, there actually wasn't a problem, uh, suddenly you e eject the, the astronauts and the rocket happily moves on and, and that's very embarrassing, right? And, and suddenly you just blow a hundred million dollars in, into, into space for, for, for nothing. So, how do we do that, right? <coughs> there, there's a few enablers that, that help us to, uh, to do that. One is uh, sensors. Um, we, we need to know something about the system and uh, we need to take measurements and we need to understand what, what is going on. Uh, those uh, measurements then need to be interpreted, right? It's, it's nice to, uh, to get some reading, um, but you need to know whether that is normal or abnormal, and, and that sometimes depends on your uh, opera operating condition. If you're in an aircraft, for example, and uh, you are uh, on the tarmac uh, just ready to take off, then uh, you know, your temperature might be, uh, I don't know, 20 degrees uh, Celsius, but when you fly at cruise altitude, you might have uh, minus 50 degrees Celsius. And, and so depending on, on what your operating condition is, uh, the, 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 the sensor information need to be interpreted properly. Then <coughs> the information and the output needs to communicate it, be communicated to somebody who uh, makes a decision what to do about the potential problem. And, and so these are the, the three elements that, that come together. And we also throw in uh, some smarts. There are some algorithms that, that try to uh, understand what, what's going on, um, some, some models, 
some uh, some physics, um, but we we also utilize methods from uh, artificial intelligence uh, to to do process that information and to come up with with the right choice. <coughs> Space station is a another example w where these kind of things are, are very important. <coughs> it floats out there in low Earth orbit. Um, it's a very complex system, and um, uh, th this was really meant as a laboratory where scientists, uh, sci science astronauts are being sent up to conduct some experiments. And what is actually happening, and I've set in some, some status reports uh, for, for the space station, is that they, they really spend most of the time that they're not either sleeping or doing some other uh, 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 things that th th they need to do to, to survive, they s spend in fixing stuff, right? So of the 100% time that they have available, they spend 85% of the time to, to repair things. And, and oftentimes, um, you know, the status report comes that, well, something is wrong, but we really don't know what is wrong, right? So that's, that's certainly not good. Or, or something uh, gave a warning signal, but now the warning signal is gone. That doesn't give us a w nice, uh, warm and, and uh, fuzzy feeling either. And, and, and so we really need to have uh, a, a good way to, to understand what, what's, what's going on. Um, performance, cost and safety um, are the, the three drivers. And what I would like to do now is, is to take you on a brief journey uh, back in time to, to really talk about, you know, how did we get to, to where we are and, and then uh, maybe extrapolate a little out on, on where we're going with, uh, with, with PHM. So going all the way back to, to when the pyramids were, were, were built, um, the, the, the Nile was uh, um, flooding every year. Uh, you had some farmers um, when, uh, when the Nile flooded the fields, they, they had to, to leave the fields. Uh, when, when the Nile was receding, uh, they were coming back. And, and then uh, the, the fights were starting because uh, all the farmers thought that you know, their, their, their plot was actually a little larger than, than the neighbors. And, and so that's when, when they first came up with um, some um, mechanism to, to measure distance and there were some officials that, that came around with, with a, a rod and, 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 and a chain and essentially marked, okay, this is officially yours and, and this is the final word, right? And interestingly, uh, that is still being used today um, in American football where the distance uh, is, is measured 10 yards uh, from, the, uh, from, from, the, uh, from the third down um, and we're, we're still utilizing that um, a proven and true method. Another one was when, when the pyramids were, were being built. Um, um, you, you had some, some guys measuring the, you see them down there in the lower right hand corner measuring whether the, uh, whether the stones were chiseled properly uh, according to size. Uh, as you know, they, they were all remarkably uh, precise and uh, you can only imagine what, what happened to the guy who was chiseling if the measurements were off uh, because you know, labor relations were not quite what they are in Sweden these days. Uh, moving on to, to the Romans, um, they uh, brought uh, water from many hundreds, if not thousands, of, of kilometers away. And you really, uh, you know, you can't cheat. The water flows <laughs> downhill. And, and so to, to be able to, to do that over that, that kind of distance is really quite a remarkable accomplish accomplishment. And so they, they built those, those aqueducts um, over long distances um, and uh, had a remarkable ability to, to really measure the, the slope uh, over, over large distances. Of course, the military was interested in, in measuring things as well. Um, uh, here you have a system that uh, measures how far you have been, been going. Um, this is starting to now be a little bit more online, right? So here you have a vehicle and um, there has, there's a mechanism that is connected to the, to the wheels. And, you know, every uh, preset distance, uh, it, it starts to uh, 
uh, ring a bell and and for uh, larger distances it, it, it uh, knocks a gong and and that is, is is sort of important because you you know if if it's reported that the the enemy is is 19 kilometers away um, you really want to go maybe 18 kilometers and not 21 right um, so it's 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 uh, it's important to uh, and, and there's some military use and, and oftentimes military still to this day is, is driving to technology development Making a large jump uh, forward in time now, in, in the 1600s, uh, Galileo <coughs> invented all kinds of uh, sensors uh, for the thermometer and making another huge jump in uh, a time now, we were now in the uh, 1700s, where the first, during the Industrial Re Revolution, the, the steam engine was, uh, was, was invented. Um, this is the open uh, at atmosphere uh, steam engine. Uh, but but now it became important to to really turn the knob on uh, on performance and to to do that uh, we we needed to again know uh, better um, how these things were were performing and also for 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 maintenance purposes of course so uh, James Watt made a whole bunch of improvements uh, miniaturized uh, the, the steam engine um, and uh, uh, you know that then drove the need to come up with uh, different kinds of gizmos that were able to uh, measure uh, what was happening on, on the steam engine. Um, here you see a device in the 1800s, and the 1800s were a, a very rich uh, development phase for uh, for for sensing uh, for for sensors, um, where um, here th on the threaded. A portion that was connected to uh, to your pressure vessel, and you had you, you see this this uh, uh, arced uh, small hollow uh, segment there. Uh, depending on the pressure inside, it, it would try to straighten out, and y you can see how it is connected to uh, this this dial there, which then on that side, if it's, it tries to straighten out, it, it would just turn the, the dial, right? So it's pretty ingenious actually, and it was done uh, a long time ago. Then, <coughs> during the same time, the first accelerometers were, were invented. Um, uh, also important uh, uh, nowadays, uh, you know, uh, we, we do some, some bearing work um, and, you know, it all can be traced back to a, a long time ago. We need to people needed to communicate what was happening, sometimes from remote locations. Um, back then, uh, the, the telegraph was the preferred choice, um, although um, there was also some wireless communications um, may not be that effective from the space station, uh, but uh, but even wireless communication uh, that uses uh, smoke signals is, is still being used today in, in emergency situations. Safety, as I mentioned, is, is a big driver, right? Safety on, on rockets is important, but but safety became uh, very apparent as a, a driver for uh, for technology development uh, when these things started to blow up, right? And um, it's it's very expensive if, if that happens, and of course if you are the uh, the the person who shovels the the, the coal into the um, into the steam engine, you know if that happens, you're you're not very happy, and and so um, there, there's uh, again a lot of motivation to to understand uh, what is happening, um, and for that you you need sensors and you need to interpret that. Um, more exploded safety vessels, uh, uh, pressure vessels. So the first primitive, or, or maybe not so primitive, uh, sensors were developed that, that now measure the pressure in relation to the, the volume, right? So uh, as we all know, um, if, if you, if you uh, change the, the, the volume in a, in a vessel, pressure increases and, and vice versa. And uh, with, with this device, uh, you could uh, mark out the entire PV uh, uh, cycle, the, the pressure volume cycle, um, as uh, the the pistons uh, in in those engines were were going back and forth, and and from that you could uh, derive your efficiency of operations, right? Because there, there was an, an optimal PV curve, and um, if you were um, deviating from that, um, you could then change uh, some of the parameters. Um, perhaps uh, uh, make the the, um, uh, the the steam hotter, um, or um, perhaps doing some some maintenance, you know, uh, fixing some leaks. Um, but but these were were really important uh, drivers to uh, to carry things forward. Monitoring, 
became important and, and again here when we're talking the 1800s uh, so these are power substations that uh, were uh, being monitored there is not really a whole lot of happening uh, until something happens so um, you, you really didn't want to have somebody sit around twi twiddle their thumbs for for 24 hours a day uh, because you had to to pay that person and so in, instead of, of doing that they would just connect um, uh, some sensors to to those uh, substations and transmit the signal to the uh, to the central office and if there was a problem being detected then they would dispatch somebody to to, to fix stuff right. so so even back then uh, remote monitoring was uh, what was be was in vogue maintenance uh, <laughs> Uh, we all care about maintenance here, uh, was, was a big driver uh, for these kind of things. Um, uh, what, we, what we see here is a sewage plant, um, and not a very sexy kind of application, but one that uh, was again a dr technology driver where uh, remote monitoring was, was being employed uh, to understand what was happening. And as you may imagine, it was important that uh, these facilities are, are working flawlessly uh, because the the consequences are uh, undesired. More maintenance. Here we are seeing some trains that the army was was maintaining. So now we're we're, we're talking about fleet management, right? So so now we we don't have just just one vehicle. We we have a whole bunch of them, and we're talking about uh, availability. Um, so these things were possibly just sitting around, but when uh, the need arose, those things needed to be available. Um, they, they had to be maintained perfectly and, and you needed to be able to, uh, to, to send them off. Um, besides the online sensors, uh, there was also some additional uh, uh, sensing happening. Uh, what you see here is a person with a hammer and he knocks on the wheels and if the the wheels have a crack you can you can hear that from from the sound right this similar thing was 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 done on the on the tracks of course as well um, um, but uh, there was some some audio signal the audio signal was was interpreted um, and as a decision to perform maintenance was was being carried out based on that later uh, safety um, was was another driver here we see the Apollo 1 capsule um, that uh, unfortunately went up in, in flames with, with people inside on the ground and there just was not uh, the, the, the kind of ability to react in time uh, to uh, events that were unfolding um, and uh, you know it, it made it very clear at, at that time to NASA that uh, safety needed to be factored in to the overall package and that uh, state assessment was, 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 was very important. This is the U-2 uh, spy plane. Um, uh, now we're talking Cold War, right? So this, this was the 50s and the, the U-2 was, was flying at extremely high altitudes over the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union is very large and it needed to make it in one piece from, from beginning to end. And um, um, some of those things w were falling out of the sky occasionally. That was very undesired. And, and so that again drove uh, the need to understand um, are these things going to be able to fly um, over the Soviet Union um, and uh, so there was some, some health assessment being done up front as well as throughout the, uh, throughout the flight. And, and so um, more capability was, was being developed um, and the rem remarkable thing is, is that that was already done during the, uh, during the 50s. Here's the, the UK uh, version of the Harrier. Um, um, those guys were now using audio tapes um, that they were interpreted after flight by somebody who was essentially reliving the, the entire flight, listening to that to understand whether the engines were exhibiting some, some strange sounds. Right? Not particularly sophisticated, but what we can see that there, there is a movement towards uh, in interpretation and collecting more information and uh, getting an overall picture of, of, uh, of what is happening. The F-8 was a, an aircraft that was used in Vietnam. Um, they were uh, very effective, uh, but they were 
um, also very prone to, to failure. And, and so this was one of the first aircraft that had some online uh, thermal sensing um, that was then being used to record the, the thermal history of, of the engine. Right? So clearly, if you're using an engine at uh, high temperatures uh, over a certain amount of time, um, you get a thermal history that is indicative of the degradation that, uh, or the stress that, that the engine sees, the thermal stress, and uh, correlated to, to the degradation that, that the engine is, is seeing. This is the A7 tech aircraft. Um, this, this is a single engine aircraft. Single engine is always uh, tricky. Uh, with, with two engines, if one engine fails, you have the, the other engine and, and usually you are able to, to come back to, to, to base. With a single engine, if one engine fails, you're toast, right? or at least the, 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 the aircraft is toast. And, and they were lo losing a lot of those due to, to engine trouble. And uh, th there was a program that was being uh, implemented in the 70s to, to integrate um, a, a number of, of, of sensors uh, in, uh, for a, a particular a squadron um, of these uh, A7s. Um, and uh, from an average of losing uh, 40 or so uh, during a year, uh, the, the loss rate went down to zero except then uh, one aircraft crashed after all. And, and so the, the general comes and says, hey, what's going on? You know, we, 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 did, we did what you said, we did the uh, uh, installation of, of the sensors, we did the health management, and they looked at the aircraft, and it, it was a loner from a different squadron. It, so it was not one that, that actually had the, the health management installed. So, so this was a, a hugely uh, successful program and, and was a, a tremendous uh, technology uh, uh, leap forward. So, what do we see here? Does anybody know what that is? Sputnik. That's right. Very good. Okay. So, so the Russians uh, brought a, a satellite into space, and uh, the Americans were not happy. And uh, so, uh, uh, Kennedy uh, issued this challenge to the, to the nation to to bring an astronaut to the moon and back safely uh, uh, before the the, the uh, end of, of the decade. And, and so there was a, a lot of t technology development for that, uh, arguably perhaps one of the largest that, that, the, that the country had seen to, to date. And what they were initially using is the, the Mercury, uh, for the Mercury program were some uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles that they were repurposing uh, to, uh, to fly into space. And now, um, they had to make a few modifications. So what they did was they put a second stage on, on top of that, Right, more fuel, and then on top of that, they, they put a capsule uh, where, where the astronauts would be sitting, and on top of that was, was the uh, abort uh, piece. And uh, <coughs> since now safety becomes more important, um, they also had to add more redundancy for, for different systems. Right? So in, in case something fails, they could uh, switch to, to, to some, some uh, redundant system. Um, they also needed to monitor uh, whether uh, abort conditions were, were happening, right? So you uh, clearly, if s somebody has to, to realize that and, um, and, and for that monitoring equipment was, was, was really important. And then you needed uh, a warning system to alert both the crew and the ground to, to initiate the abort. And um, uh, you know, that, that was all done by reviewing the failure history, the flight history, and so on to, to come up with, with some nominal, nominal procedures um, for, uh, uh, for, for these kind of conditions. Um, now, you know, this, this was already part of the Apollo program, and uh, you, you also have to commit to certain numbers. Right? So um, you, you have to be able to commit to uh, what uh, is your risk propensity, um, how much risk are you willing to, to take that, that something goes wrong. And, um, and here you see some numbers, I, I got this from, from the web, so this is all public. Uh, there was one in 100 of, of mission completion and one in 1,000 of, of crew return. Right? So that doesn't sound that great, um, right? but, but these are the kind of tough choices that, that you have to make. And, and they're trade-offs, right? You, you have a budget, 
right? If you have an infinite budget, you can move these numbers down, right? Maybe not all the way to zero, but 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 close closer to it. Uh, but if you have a limited budget, uh, you know you you can only get to to certain uh, risk numbers, and and these are some some really important insights, and and that's typically what we have to start out with is 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 some of these requirements. Um, and also then what was needed was a uh, a mechanism to quantify um, the, the the risk, right? So as you as we were designing systems, you have to figure out okay. Um, how likely is it that that uh, things are, are failing? So, so for a while, the the quantitative risk models were were in vogue, until they they realized that they actually had no way to uh, come up with priors uh, for uh, some of of those components because they were brand new. Nobody had ever used them, so so there was no history of uh, of, of understanding how how well they would be working. So they gave that up and instead used a, a failure mode and effect analysis, uh, which is still being used today, right? Not not just in NASA, but but in many other systems. And if if you don't know that, you know you really uh, should take a look at that. Um, so what what you do is you go methodically to each through each uh, portion of the design, and you you're trying to determine what are the potential faults. You also try to de determine the impact, and uh, if if possible, you, you try to design out the problem, if you can, if it's not too expensive, but thereby just eliminating the, the failure mode um, or mitigate the consequences in some other ways. Right? Another way would be, um, well, I need to know about the fault, so I, if I can't see it, I'm going to put a sensor on there so that, that I can see it, and, and then you, know, you still have to have a procedure that then deals with, with the problem. Redundancy is, is one important mechanism to mitigate uh, a problem, other than just you know ejecting the 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 the, uh, the, the astronauts. <coughs> so, um, what we see here is the uh, Apollo uh, booster instrument unit, and uh <coughs> it's it's in a ring. Uh, inside, uh, there's actually the, the the fuel, right? So, so all that is is used uh, is used, and and outside there's a little space, and and that's where all the instruments were were mounted. Uh, as an example, there was the uh, rocket guidance system in there, and it uses triply modular redundant uh, circuits. And so that, that's one computer with, with redundant components, but, you know, it's expensive. And um, as you may remember in Apollo 13, which, which had the, the mishap where the, the fuel cell exploded during the flight, um, some of you may have seen the, the, the movie. Um, um, if if you, you're your problem occurs at a point where you have a single mode that knocks out the, the in, in entire system downstream. Having redundancy still doesn't help you, right? Because uh, uh, it's, it's, it's no use to, to have redundancy when uh, the, the information or, or the energy or, or whatever feeding it is, 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 is missing. So, but anyhow, so the, the point is, is you, you're trying to ideally spread uh, your, your redundant system throughout the system to, to minimize the, the impact. Apollo design uh, was r really quite, quite elegant. Um, so where, where possible, there was a redundancy f and, and safety improvements for the launch vehicle board systems and the launch escape, escape uh, system. But you know, redundancy in, in itself is not it really doesn't make the system sufficiently uh, more reliable. It, it also depends on, on how you implement stuff. Um, it's also not feasible for all sus subsystems. For example, um, during lunar descent, the crew could abort the landing by separating the descent stage and returning to lo lunar orbit with ascent stage. Right? So there was really no redundancy of instrumentation that said, OK, you can continue. They had to abort things. And uh, the, the primary mission objective was to, to bring crew home safely, right? So there was, they would then just uh, sacrifice the secondary mission objective, which is uh, land on the moon, you know, do some science, and, and then come back. And then on the lunar surface, there was no abort capability. There was no engine out capability. Um, and it was a sort of a one-shot deal. And uh, um, then, uh, you, again, you look at your budget. And somebody said, well, it's, uh, it's just too expensive. Um, 
uh, to add uh, some some redundancy or some mitigation. So you know, good luck. We we think it's reliable enough, and uh, you know, luckily things things worked out. Um, you also have to deal with how, how much redundancy you want to put on. Um, it's it's nice to have uh, two of everything. Of course, if you have one sensor that says everything is fine, and another sensor says uh, you you have a problem, which one are you going to believe? Right. So so maybe uh, you should have three sensors. So if if one says everything is fine and two say uh, you have a problem, then you know you just have democracy in action and you, you vote, and you have two sensors say. <laughs> Bad. One says good. And you go with bad, right? That's that's certainly possible. Um, but you can also go methodically through that, and and then as you are an adding more more sensors, uh, you can show that uh, you're you're making uh, your system increasingly more safe, and and the the kind of uh, decisions that are based on on that uh, go to a risk level that that can be managed, right? So with uh, so, for example, if if you have what does it say there? Um, if if uh, so, so if you're increasing the number of of sensors very quickly, you get into uh, one in a billion uh, uh, flight uh, or, or or bad decisions, and and so you know these these are the kind of things that that can be computed and, and calculated. Quickly, um, people realized okay, there's some really important stuff happening and organizations uh, formed around that. So in the 60s, uh, the uh, ISO, the International Standardization Organization, uh, started a working group on diagnostics and prognostics. In 1967, uh, the Machinery Failure and Prevention Technologies uh, a group of was, was founded. In uh, 1973, the SAE uh, started the E32 for, for engine health monitoring. And in 2008, the PHM Society was was founded. So, so these are all organizations that uh, really rally around uh, uh, health management as a as a discipline. Now, I quickly want to go into uh, some more civilian types of applications. Right? It's nice to talk about rockets, but you know we don't use a rocket on a on a daily basis. Um, uh, we use other stuff, or we can potentially use other stuff. Uh, hopefully, you're not, uh, you don't have to use a, uh, this kind of device here anytime soon. It's a CT scanner. Um, it is uh, uh, obviously uh, needed in emergency cases, and um, if you're running a hospital, you really have to make sure that that thing works. And if you're a patient, just like an astronaut, and you you're in need of it, you know you you can't just come and they say, oh, you know. Uh, we, we're doing some maintenance, come back in three days. You need it right then and there, right? So um, uh, GE in the 80s uh, implemented a, a program where they were remotely probing the CT scanners and siphoning off sensor information. And it was done uh, using uh, this device here. Does anybody know what that is? It's a modem, right? So it's an old-fashioned uh, modem, and that's exactly the kind of thing that they were using back then, right? They were dialing in to, to the CT scanner and, and reading off information, and it was not at that time, like always, you know, somebody starts to operate stuff, and, and then they start to scratch their head and say, well, we don't really know what's going on, right? So they were reading off the debug log that programmers had written for, for their own purposes. And, and then um, the uh, GE people were, were trying to reason over, over that and trying to see patterns whether if, if, the, if the log looks like that, you know, it, it, it means that this, uh, this component is, uh, is, is broken. So it was, was sort of an, an early application of, of data-driven uh, uh, diagnostics. Worked actually really well, so well that the hospital operator said, well, you know, we don't think that we need uh, your services because our CT scanner seems to be operational all the time. There's a lesson in there as well, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Airlines. We all fly. We are all very unhappy when there is a delay and cancellation. And uh, airlines are un un unhappy then as well because if they have to rebook you, on a competitor's uh, aircraft, you know, it comes straight from, from their bottom line. Um, and uh, so they really would like to avoid any kind of delay or cancellation. 
how can we do that? Or how, how do, how do what they want to do that, right? So, so they are interested in getting an understanding of the health of the system, of the engines, of, of the landing gear, of the navigation system, of everything that, that really needs to function. And the FAA in, in, in the United States um, has very strict requirements for, for what has to work. And, and so um, in the 90s, uh, again, GE implemented a, a remote monitoring program where there were a siphoning off information from aircraft in flight and, and they were being uh, assessed and uh, a, um, uh, the result was, was being given back in, in real time to, to operators. Cost, big driver. Uh, safety also, what you see here is a, uh, a turbine engine and um, um, this, this one didn't behave quite like it was supposed to behave. You, you see that um, the uh, turbine ruptured. The, the nacelle, which is the thing that is, that, that is covering the, the, the turbine, is supposed to contain it. Um, in it does so uh, in most of the cases, sometimes it does not. Uh, and then, you know, if it flies through the fuselage, um, you may have some very unhappy mm, uh, flyers, in particular if you're sitting uh, right next to the engine. Um, so, not to make you nervous, but, you know, um, um, again, this is a, a, a driver for understanding the health of these systems before something like, like that happens. Right? Because not only um, uh, is it bad PR, but the FAA will, will shut down your operations until they understand A, what happens, and B, that it's not going to happen again. So, so, so all that, a uh, good example for, for, for health management. Another one, maintenance cost, you know, um, again, is, is a, a primary motivator for um, understanding what needs to be fixed at what time um, so, so that you um, are optimally uh, using your, your assets. Um, wind turbines, same thing, in particular if, if you have offshore wind turbines, um, you, you care about the health of, y of your blades, you care about the health of your uh, bearings, clearly you, you also care about the health of your, of your generator. Um, and if these things are not operational, it's, it's very hard and very expensive to get maintenance personnel uh, out there. You have to fly them out with, with a helicopter and uh, you know, ideally you would like to avoid that. I talked about some of the algorithms and, and that we are uh, borrowing um, uh, mechanisms from artificial intelligence. You know, we all have seen some of the movies, um, the, the, the kind of AI that we're using for prognostics and health management uh, usually doesn't uh, have some uh, uh, chic looking robot that, that, that helps us out, uh, but we are condensing the, the same kind of smarts uh, to really reason over um, uh, you know, what, what is happening and what needs to be done. Right? And um, uh, I couldn't help myself but, but show at least one slide you know, that has at least uh, something that looks a little bit like, uh, like a formula. Um, so um, if you lift the, the hood of, of, of your smarts, you, know, you have the classical AI with, with uh, a predicate logic. Um, uh, neural nets are all the rage right now. They were in the 50s inspired by uh, how the brain works. Of course, it really is nothing like how the brain works, but it still does something really, really useful. Right? And in, in more recent years, the, the, the deep learning neural nets um, uh, are all the rage. Um, and there's a lot of hype in, in there. Don't believe all the hype, but it still sometimes does some, some useful stuff. Fuzzy logic, case-based reasoning, uh, classification and regression trees, random forests. So these are all uh, mechanisms that are being used uh, under the umbrella of AI that can do uh, really uh, fabulous things for, uh, for, for maintenance. Um, once we come up with uh, information that something is wrong, it really never is completely deterministic, right? You, you're never really 100% sure. And so one thing that you have to deal with is um, express how sure you are. And uh, you really don't just want to wave uh, your hand on that and, and say, hey, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I'm reasonably sure. You, you want to ideally, uh, methodically quantify your uncertainty sources and, and also 
uh, uh, stack up your uncertainties so, so that you can give the decision maker information and tell them how, how sure you are. And you can do this in, in the probabilistic domain or the fuzzy domain or, or whatever you want. Moving on now to some, some other applications um, that are driver for prognostic health management is the self-driving car. So what we see here is the Google car. I live in Mountain View where, where Google is headquartered um, and these things are driving around there all the time, driverless. Um, you know, for a couple of years ago, my, when I drove my kids to work, uh, we, we, we used to count them on the way to school. Um, <coughs> now we don't do that anymore because the novelty has worn off and it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's bec becoming so uh, omnipresent, it's, it's not a big deal anymore, right? Um, but um, it's not just uh, terrestrial applications. Um, uh, there are um, self-driving, uh, self-flying vehicles uh, being worked on right now. Um, some of them already um, are out as prototypes. Um, th there are some that you may know about that have in, in Dubai that uh, from some uh, Chinese company that fly from one skyscraper to, to the next. And uh, Uber Elevate is, is working on uh, the self-flying uh, vehicles. Uh, of course, we all know about the, the Amazon package delivery. Um, so this stuff is coming and these vehicles need to know how well they're doing. And you as a passenger want to make sure that those vehicles know <laughs> um, how, how they're doing. Um, so, so having uh, state awareness is, is really important. Right? Uh, so autonomous operations is, is going to be a driver for uh, for a lot of uh, uh, prognostic health management um, and uh, one thing that we have to then deal with is um, how do we come up with with an optimal solution and, and so um, that is under the, the umbrella of decision making these can oftentimes be um, uh, encapsulated as uh, multi-objective uh, decision problems um, um, very interesting um, but, but also very uh, complicated um, we really need to deal with uh, trust and assurance um, uh, for autonomous vehicles, in particular uh, also when you have uh, learning uh, as part of, of your solution. How do you make sure that the, what, whatever this thing learns um, is uh, the, the right thing? Right? And uh, for, for us in particular at, at NASA, you want to be able to, to explain why the, the uh, system came up with, with the solution. So explainable AI is, is some sort of subfield that is, that is being worked on. Hardware makes some, some remarkable progress right now. Uh, we are seeing um, supercomputers that are now being put onto, onto, a, sh onto a chip. Um, we, we now can fly uh, uh, GPUs that, that have you know, hundreds of, of processors in, in parallel. Um, and uh, it, it just speeds up and, and, and opens up uh, opportunities. It's, it's, it's just really remarkable. Um, there's also analog new chips, uh, neuromorphic chips that, uh, that are trying to go a little bit closer to, to how the brain operates. Still not anywhere close to what, what it is doing, um, but, but again, there are some exciting uh, developments out there. And we also have a quantum computer where, where I work. I have a group of, of 12 people who try to understand what are the quantum phenomena and how do we harness the, uh, the potential that, that quantum computing uh, can give us. And there's, there's tremendous potential. It really could, could open the world to an uh, entire new paradigm of, of computing. Um, um, of course, the, the chips themselves are, are still very, very small. Um, and the whole apparatus has to be cooled down to 20 millikelvin, uh, which is uh, mm, remarkable because outer space you have three kelvin, so you know it's an order magnitude colder than, than outer space itself. To uh, emerging applications, I, I mentioned uh, 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 certainly spacecraft, aircraft, drones, on-demand mobility. So, so that's the. Uh, you know, you call up Uber and, and, and your air taxi arrives. Uh, Self-driving vehicles at, at NASA, these are rovers, you know, in Mountain View, the, these are your, your uh, autonomous eggs. Habitats, um, um, so these are your smart buildings, except, you know, our buildings are on, 
on Mars or somewhere else. Uh, certainly, um, if you're there as an astronaut, uh, you, you want to make sure that your life support works, um, that your um, oxygen recovery works, you know, all, all that kind of stuff systems that need to be maintained and and um, and, and need to be uh, processed and also assembly right so what we think is we're gonna send some unmanned uh, uh, vehicles to mars and have some robots assemble the habitat uh, all by themselves and uh, hopefully they can get along and and, uh, and do the right thing and uh, uh, you know, you have to make sure that all that works, right? Because all that will be autonomous. So, and then manufacturing also. And I mentioned deep space operations, right? So here's the space launch system on, on the right. It's supposed to bring us to, to Mars. Uh, Mars is an exciting venue. It is really far away. It might take, you know, six to nine months to, to get there. It might take six to nine months to, to get back. Um, and then once, you know, it takes you more than a year to get somewhere and get, go back, you're not going to stay just for the weekend, right? So you're going to probably sp stay there for half a year. So, so now we're talking about year and a half, two years or so that, that you're, that you're going to be gone. And you can't just uh, call home and say, hey, you know, my tire is flat. You know, can you, can you send uh, a, a service quick to, to fix my tire? So everything has to be dragged along or everything has to fix itself. And, and so this is really sort of the, the, the next frontier for, um, for prognostics and, and, and health management. And with that, I'd like to uh, conclude. What we want to avoid is the stuff on the, on the right, right? So I, I started out with some dramatic pictures of, of, of rockets exploding. And I was, I was explaining um, how uh, prognostics and health management can help to, to, uh, to solve some of these solutions. And uh, certainly uh, at, at NASA we care about that, uh, but uh, I try to also show you that there are lots of civilian applications uh, where these technologies are uh, useful and, and helpful and, and actually needed. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for this very, very interesting kind of journey through engineering kind of history and all this kind of future kind of challenges so but i think we'll see if anyone would like to ask a question i have one question actually looking to the literature of phm prognostics and health management i say the weightage is on the finding remaining useful life 80 percent or 90 percent of literature deal with what is prognostics but very little on the health management like what to do and how to decide. So prescriptive side of the story is really not taking off. Uh, right, so all that is, is still uh, being developed, right? So the prognostics uh, really just generates information. Yeah. And what we hear sometimes is, if I tell you that your, your system will break in three weeks, then they ask, well, what, what do you want me to do, mm. right? Do I just keep going for another two and a half weeks or for three weeks or you know do i need to fix it now or do i need to operate it differently because i want to maybe extend my life for four weeks and and that is really uh an, an area where the decision making comes in right and so we need to factor that in we need to factor in uh, uh, maintenance considerations, uh, the whole logistics chain needs, needs to go in there. Uh, we need to figure out what, what is the, the, the mission actually. Um, and, and so um, this uh, is a very active research area and, and I would agree that certainly we, we have not uh, brought this, this to, a, to a level of maturity that, that, that it could be. Actually, assessment of the risk of different actions and all. And we want to find our group because many of you are here. We're trying to go towards that side. That's an area still unexplored. And I see with contact with Chinese, uh, and they are, they are very interested. They say, you tell me what is the remaining, that doesn't tell anything to me. Tell me what to do and when to do exactly, and what risk I'm taking and what risk I'm putting into the by decision. Right. So that's the. Yeah. Back there. Uh, 
Uh, you mentioned that the space station, uh, the staff that goes up there, the astronauts there, they are to 85% busy just maintaining the, the space station itself. Uh, I guess that that would also be a very important area for you to look into when it comes to how to create functional support systems for the astronauts going to Mars as well. So it's not only about what you can call the measurements and analysis, but also, okay, I know this. How, what do I do now? What kind of tools do I have access to and how can I combine the different solutions so I minimize my resource use? So I guess that that is a kind of an intermixing between human human sciences and pure technological knowledge management and all these things. So I guess that that could also be an area of interest for you in the future. Absolutely. And um, what we really need to do is to, to remind ourselves when was the space station designed? Right? And, and it's actually a, a thing that is many decades old now when, when it was first conceived and, and designed. Right? So now we, we know more about how to go, go about things and, and what are the issues that, that can crop up. And it is really important to feed that back into the design cycle to make sure that it gets absorbed and uh, considered to avoid uh, the operational kind of problems that uh, inevitably otherwise would, would, would occur. And um, that is another research opportunity um, to make sure that we, we have the, the right considerations during the uh, design cycle for uh, resilient operations, for resilient systems, um, and to, to make sure that uh, um, we not only maximize astronaut time, but, but that we make uh, systems uh, safe. I agree. Marty. You said that uh, it took like two years maybe to go to Mars and back mm -hmm. from a mission. It's pretty similar to this when they sailed around the world and tried to discover new worlds. It took like two, three years, they were gone. And um, are they looking into things like uh, the social aspects, like mutiny on the ships? Uh, because in those days, many captains were killed because the crew wanted to go home. <laughs> so, I mean, those things will most likely happen also on these Mars trips. Mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, of course, you wonder where would they go, right? <laughs> they might. Um, th there are experiments of that nature that are being conducted already, uh, where there are some long-term uh, 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 studies where they put people into habitats lock the door and, and then you know a year later they, they open it again and look who's left. <laughs> not quite like that, right? I, I hope this is not going to be on YouTube. So, um, uh, you, You're absolutely right. The uh, social aspects are, are very important. Uh, trying to understand you know what does it take uh, to, uh, to live together on extremely close quarters for a very long time. You know, what, um, what kind of traits do people need to have so that they, that, so that they fit together that they can get along and that uh, uh, these undesired uh, outcomes are, are being avoided. Yeah. Okay, I think we, I think there are millions of questions actually. It's so kind of interesting topic, but I think it's almost one o'clock sharp. So I think it's time to say thank you again and have a small flower for you. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>